Hi, I'm Sam Ben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled The Basics of the Global Gyrator Switched Resonator Converter. The presentation is based on a paper to be published at the IEEE Transaction on Power Electronics. At the YouTube description, there is a link to IEEE Explore for downloading uh, the paper. Let me first cover the general architecture of the converter. We have a resonator here, which includes a inductor, a capacitor, series of switches, and then I am showing here voltage sources, but this could be a voltage source, could be a battery, and could be a load like a smartphone or any other device. These switches are capable of connecting the resonator to these ports one at a time, and in this case, we're assuming a sequential operation. That is, S1 is turned on, and then turned off, and then S2 is turned on, and then turns off, S3 turned on, etc., up to the very last uh, port here, and then it starts again. So this is a perpetual operation. Again, I'm showing here a sequential operation. However, uh, it's not necessary. In fact, we'll, I'll show later on that you can get different type of operation if you switch uh, the ports in a different sequence. But let's start with the assumption that the connection here is sequential and going on and on. These switches, which are shown here as a switch, uh, will be implemented by MOSFETs and it could be a bidirectional connection like shown here or in some application we can get by, by one MOSFET or even by a dial. But again, just for simplifying things at the beginning, let's assume that these are bi-directional switches. So we have here a case, just a demonstration of a source, which say could be a charger, the output of a charger. We have a load, which could be say a smartphone, and then we have a battery. And the purpose of this converter is to deliver energy from the source to the load or end the battery and then in another phase of operation take energy from the battery into the load. So these switches, as I'll show later on, are capable of doing all these functions uh, just by changing the sequence of connection. So in this particular case, again, we are assuming a source a load, a battery, and in one mode of operation we have energy coming out of the source into the load and then also charging the battery. Before going into further detail, we need to cover the issue of capacitor charging when a resonator is connected to a voltage source. So I'm showing here a resonator, L and C. There is some initial voltage on the capacitor there is a voltage source here, and I'm showing here, in, just for illustration, in a graphical way, this is the voltage of the capacitor, this is the voltage of the voltage source, and here we see what happens as the switch is turned on. As it is turning on, there is a resonant current generated here, and it's shown here as a half a sinusoidal waveform, we are going to turn the switch off here so that the capacitor will start charging with this current which is flowing here. Actually it's in this direction and we'll have the capacitor charging all the way through the voltage of V1 and actually it'll reach a higher voltage. As it turns out, if the difference between the initial voltage of the capacitor and the voltage source is delta V, the capacitor will reach a voltage which is delta V higher than V1. So the total span is 2 delta V. The current is sinusoidal, and again we are turning it off here, which means that we have a zero current switching, a turn on, and a turn off. Now the basic relationships here are 
we can find that the average current averaged over the whole sequence, that is all the switches, all the M switches, the timing of all the M switches, and perhaps there might be some dead time in between. So this is the total time of a sequence. Then the average current is 2C, capacitor capacitance, times delta V over T. This is the average current of this process. Now this duration of this half sinusoidal waveform is half of the full uh, cycle, and therefore this time here, T sub P, is pi square root of LC. Now this is correct, of course, for a high quality factor circuit, that is the losses are relatively low, so that uh, we'll have a nice sinusoidal waveform. So here what happens, in this particular case that I've discussed earlier, we have a source, we have a load, we have a battery. The switching states are S1, S2, S3, S1, S2, S3, and then nothing. S4 at this stage is not involved. What will happen is that when S1 is on, then we'll have energy coming off the source. We see here this current of the source. We see it also here, the resonant resonator current. And of course, this is current here is equal to this current here. And at this time, the capacitor will be charging. Here we see the capacitor charging. Next, after turning off S1, we turn on S2. Then we'll have current going into the load. Here it is going into the load. And we'll see it here negative. Negative because the direction is opposite to the direction we had it before. We call positive current coming off out of a source and negative going into the source. So this will be sort of a negative current, this direction as shown here. And then we'll have the battery current. That is, we have energy from the resonator into the battery. Here it is. And of course, when the current to the load and to the battery is coming off the capacitor, the capacitor is discharging and getting back to the initial value. This period here is no operation, nothing really happens, and then we can start again. Here I'm showing it in a more detail, the capacitor voltage. During the turn on of this source, capacitor is charging. During the S2 period, we have energy coming off the capacitor, so it's partially discharging. And then we have energy going into the battery and the capacitor is still discharging. Nothing happens here. Now, this dead time is very important because I can introduce dead time and by this I can, I can control the average current coming off the source or into the other ports. And this will be by so-called pulse density modulation. That is, I'm sort of diluting down uh, the pulses by uh, bringing in more dead time uh, between the sequences. Now, let's have a closer look at what really happens to the capacitor during this operation that I've just described. I'm assuming that the, I have a voltage V1, which is 3 volt, I have a voltage V2, which is 4 volt, and then I have a voltage 5 volt, and I have a capacitor which has an initial value of 1 volt. This is the capacitor voltage. The red dots signify the capacitor voltage, the black dots signify the voltage of the ports. So we start with one volt, and as we have shown before, we have the capacitor voltage going to delta V. So from one, it'll go to five, because there's a difference of two here, and then there's a difference of two here. So this will be the capacitor voltage after the first switching state. Then we turn on the next switch, which is connected to a port which has a 4 volt. 4 volt is a little bit lower than the 5, so therefore there is a reduction of the capacitor voltage. And again, it'll be 2 delta V, 
and it'll end up here. This is the capacitor voltage after the second state. And on the third state, we turn on again the port which has 5 volts, and since it's higher, then the delta V will be higher. So this is what the capacitor will have to do, starting from this voltage, when connected to this port, it'll go up to here, and then here, and then eventually here. This is for the switching sequence of V1, V2, and V3, when I've just arbitrarily chosen 3 volt, 4 volt, and 5 volt. Now, if I start here, going all the way up, I end up with a capacitor voltage which is different from this capacitor initial voltage. This is the sequence, and now I'm starting a new sequence. So this situation is not good, because this is not a steady state situation. In a steady state situation, I like to end up with the capacitor voltage, which is exactly equal to the um, initial capacitor voltage at the start of the sequence. So that when I start afresh in the new sequence, I'll have exactly the same waveform. So this is not a good situation. Luckily, we have found by a mathematical analysis that for the case of odd number of switches, odd n, the number of ports, for this case, the capacitor will adjust itself automatically for stability. That is, there is nothing you have to do. It will automatically converge to the right voltage by itself. And this can be shown in a very rigorous way. So there is nothing we have to do about it. It will do it by itself. Furthermore, if you would like to calculate the capacitor voltage before any switching state, in this case, say, port I, anywhere, then this is the equation that allows us to calculate this voltage before state I, this is I minus 1, before connecting to port I. This is the sum over the whole sequence from that point on, and it turns out there is a multiplier here, which I'll talk about in a second, which we have to take into account. So let's see what this equation actually means. I'm stressing again that this equation is correct for a sequence that has an odd number of switching states. Okay? I'm taking an example. Suppose we have a sequence of M states, that is M switching states, and the port signals, or the voltages, are minus 1 volt, 4 volt, 3 volt, 1 volt, and minus 3 volt. This is just an arbitrary sequence, uh, nothing special about it. So suppose I like to calculate what is the capacitor voltage just before state switching state 3 is turned on. Okay, so here we are. This is the sequence. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and then it starts again. V1, V2, V3, etc. Now I'm interested to look at this point just before port 3 is turned on and to calculate what is the voltage of this capacitor, of the resonator capacitor, using this equation. Okay? So what this equation actually says that you have to add up all these voltages, but with a plus minus plus minus sign, because we have here a coefficient of minus 1 to the power of n. When n is 0, this is when we start, this is positive, and then when n is 1, it's negative, minus. When in n is 2, then it's positive again. So we have a sequence of plus minus plus minus plus etc. So we have now to add V3 plus V3. V3 is 3 volt, so I'm adding it. Minus V4. V4 is 1 volt, so it's minus 1 volt. And then plus V5. And V5 is minus 3, so it's plus 
minus 3 and then it goes on to the V1 because it's sort of folding and it's with a minus sign V1 is minus 1 so it's minus minus 1 and then finally we have V2 which is the last uh, terminal in this sequence which is V2 is 4 so it's plus V4 so as I add all these things up it turns out that they are equal to 4 volts so what I have found is that the voltage of the capacitor before I'm turning on port 3 is 4 volt. So let's check it out. We are starting with a capacitor voltage of 4 volt. This is according to calculation we've just made. The first port to be connected has a voltage of 3 volt, then it is 1 volt, and then minus 3, and then minus 1, and then goes to uh, 4 volts. So the capacitor voltage starts from 4, goes to to 2, and then to 0, and then to minus 5, and then all the way to 4. And since the voltage here is 4, then there is no change, and it ends out here at 4. So lo and behold, the capacitor voltage is reaching the same value. So you can now start another sequence, and it is a stable situation. So this is a very remarkable feature of this uh, converter. Now, let me now turn to the term gyrator, which we are going to expand on later on, and define what we are meaning by this term. So, gyrator is actually been suggested by Telegan in 1948. It's a concept. There's no device like that. It's a concept of a actually two-port network. Telegram suggested this symbol, but we are using a two conventional two-port presentation. We have an input, we have an output current coming in, and also coming in here. This is a convention for a, a two-port network uh, for positive current. And this gyrator uh, is actually a relationship between the input and the output. This relationship is shown here in a matrix form. This is a Y matrix. This is the currents and here the voltages, which actually means the following, that I1, that is the current coming into the gyrator, is equal to some constant, G is a constant, times V2. I1 is a function of V2, that is V2 times a constant G. And I2 is also equal to V1, that is the voltage of the input port, times minus G, the same constant, but with negative sign. Well, this negative sign actually signifies the fact that the current will be coming out, because positive is in, negative will be out, and of course, if this generator is lossless, then if a current coming in, then a current must be coming out. So this is a generator, and the interesting feature about it is that it is a current source. That is I2, let's take I2, is a function of V1. So you can load it, and the current will stay constant. It will not change because it is a function of the voltage of V1 only. That is, if you change V1, then I2 will change. Now I'm going to show that the converter we are talking about is actually behaving like what I call global gyrator. That is a gyrator which is, has a multi-port configuration. That is not just two ports, but they are M ports. M could be any number. There is a common ground, and these are the ports. First, second, third, etc. Each one has a voltage, and there is a current going in or out. And I'll use the convention that the current coming out of the port is positive. This is just a matter of convention uh, to simplify things in the analysis I'm going to present. So, what I'm saying is that this configuration, this architecture of switches, ports, 
and resonator actually behave as a global gyrator and we have M ports, this is the M ports here and we have voltages and current coming out and again I'm emphasizing the current coming out is positive and cu current going in we'll consider it as a negative current. Now a mathematical analysis of this circuit, which I'm not going into detail, whoever is interested is welcome to read the paper, shows that the relationship between the port current and the port voltage is this matrix times a constant. Okay, let's just open it, just for simplification, see what it really means. And what it means is the following. It says that the port current, I1, is equal to sine constant times the sum, but here again we have plus minus plus minus of all the voltages in the sequence except V1. I2, very similarly, zero for the place of V2, but then again plus minus plus minus etc. and there is an overflow here of minus of V1. And then I3 will be the same. It's the sum of voltages, again, with plus, minus, etc., up to Vn and up to the last section. So we have a diagonal zero and then a plus, minus, plus, minus um, summation here of the voltages. Again, I'm stressing this is for an odd number m in the sequence. This is a theoretical result. And what it really means is that the current is a function of the voltages of the other ports. That is, the current of port 1 is a function of the voltages of the other ports. So this is why this is actually a gyrator, because the current of a gyrator is a function of voltages, not of the same port, but of the other ports. So this is why we call this a global gyrator. It's a gyrator, multidimensional, having any number of ports. In this case, we are signifying it as M. Let's take an example. Suppose we have V in 5 volt. This is the example I've used before. This is a source like a charger. This is a load, and this is a battery. Here is V in is 5 volt. V load is 6 volt and V battery is 4.5 volts. And the, and the switching sequence is S1, S2, S3 going on and on. In this case, as I have said, uh, energy will come in, out of the charger and into the load and into the battery. Now this is the matrix, and when we open it, here what we find. We find that the current of V in is 2C over T2. T2 is the total sequence, that is the time for S1, S2, S3. If there is no uh, dead time, then it, that's it. If there is dead time, you have to include it. It's 2C over the total time times 1.5. This is the 1.5 voltage, the difference between these two here. And then the current of the load, I2, will be minus, same constant, times 0.5. Minus means current coming in. Plus is coming out, minus coming in. And then the current of the battery, I3, will be again minus 2C over T2 times 1. It will be here. 2C over T is a constant. So here is what happens. We have the current. As the switches are turned on, we have the current of the source, current of the load, current of the battery, and here I'm showing the average current of the source, the battery, and the load, and comparing the simulation results to the calculation according to the equation that we have just seen, and as you will see that uh, the matching is excellent. This is for the case of a capacitor which is a 0.2 microfarad, the inductor of 49 or Henry, and the frequency of the total sequence is 850 kilohertz. This is just one an example for simulation, but 
uh, experimental result showing the same degree of agreement between the results and the uh, theory. I'll show some later. So, in this case, if the switching sequence is S1, S2, and S3, we will have energy coming out of the source into the load and into the battery. By changing the sequence, for example, if we we'll change it to S1, S2, and S4, S1, S2, and S4, this is now a short, we'll have energy coming off the source and into the load. S3 now is disconnected. Now the purpose of S4, you can look at it this way, is actually to make sure that we have an odd number of switching states in the sequence. If we have S1 and S2, this is even. So we are adding this short circuit. It's not doing anything. There's no loss of energy because this is a resonant circuit. It is just used to comply with the requirement that there will be an odd number of switching states in the sequence. If, however, the sequence will be S1, S3, and S4, S1, S3, and S4, what will happen is that it will have energy coming off the source and charging the battery. Again, we need S4. And if it will be S3, S2, and S4, S3, coming energy coming off the battery, S2, into the load, and S4, for the odd number, will have energy actually coming off the battery into the load, and this will be in the off state. So as we can see, this is very, very convenient that by the same topology, same architecture, same converter, you can do all type of energy transferred between the ports just by changing the sequence. I'm showing here some experimental results, which first of all were used to validate the numbers, that is, to see that the average current is according to the theory, which came out to be very nice, but also to show that the response of the circuit is extremely fast. What we've done here is we started with a sequence V1, V2, 0, port 1, port 2, and then a short, and it'll go on port 1, point 2, and a short. And then at a given point here, we change to a sequence which is V1, port 1, V2, 0, and then again, port 2 and 0. As it turns out, using the equation that I've shown before, uh, we can show that this causes an increase in the current. And we see it here. This is the first sequence, this is the second sequence, and as you can see, the peak currents are much higher here. And what is very interesting is that the response time is very quick. Almost within one cycle, we are changing from one sequence to another. And here we get then a boost in the current. So this is another way of control. Rather than diluting the pulses, actually enhancing uh, the pulses. This is just a zoom of these two cases. We see here the inductor current or the resonator current and we see here the uh, capacitor uh, voltage and here we see the um, actually a marker for the time that the switch is connected to the source. So let me just summarize what we have seen here. Now the global generator switch resonate converter is actually a multi-port converter which behaves as a gyrator multi-port gyrator. It is gyrator behave, which means that we have actually current sources which are function of the voltages of the other ports. That is, if in a given case you load the port, the current will not change because the current is a function of the voltages of the other ports. 
it's bi-directional. By changing the sequence, you can get energy from one port to another or vice versa. It has a zero current switching behavior. Uh, that is, you turn on and off the switches under zero current. The capacitor voltage is self-adjusting. You don't have to do anything. It's automatically adjusting for proper operation. There is no energy storage in the inductor. This means that the inductor could be very small, and indeed it is, and here are some examples. Say for a case of a 9 volt input, 5 volt output, 15 amp output, frequency of the sequence of 200 kilohertz, which means a uh, duration of 5 microseconds, which means that for each, this is a 3 switching state sequence, for each one will have 1.67 microsecond timing, for this is half of the resonance cycle. We'll need a capacitor of 4.7 microfarad, an inductor of 59 nanohenry. Now this could be a ceramic capacitor, could be very small, and the inductor could actually be an air inductor, actually a piece of wire will have a 59 nanohenry. And there is another example uh, for a 48 volt input, 24 volt output, 20 amp output, which would be 480 watts. Again, assuming this should be a frequency of 200 kilohertz, the duration of the sequence is 5 microseconds and duration of half of the resonant cycle is 1.6 microsecond. In this case, we need a capacitor of 1 microfarad and an inductor of 278 nanohertz. So we are talking about a capacitor that could be a ceramic capacitor and very small value inductors. The last feature that I'm mentioning here is that the switching sequence can be changed on the fly and by this we can change the direction, we can change the magnitude, and we, by this we can control the operation of the circuit. Again, the presentation is based on this paper, and there is a link for a download from IEEE Explore at the YouTube. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have found this presentation interesting, and that it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you.